evening, everyone. Intermittently, we have been looking at some of the congregations mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 3 with the aim of making sure that we as a congregation are where we're supposed to be, that we are doing those things we are supposed to do, going in line with the theme of this year, equipping the saints. We want to make sure that we're well equipped in every good work. We want to make sure that we're well equipped to do the work that is set before us, especially as it relates to our five-year plan to do those things that God has encouraged us to do, that God has commanded us, yea, to do in his word. And I can think of no better example, no better paradigms than the ones that are found in the book of Revelation where we can go to a congregation, we can visit the town there, if you will, the, the church of Christ of Laodicea is where we will be tonight, the church on the fence as I have titled it, and you'll notice why. We can go to this congregation and we can actually look at how they operate it and we have inspired divine advice given to them by God, commandments given to them. We know exactly what they did, how they did it, what their character was, what their disposition was when they did it. And so we can know without a shadow of a doubt what is wrong in the sight of God in a congregation. We can know without a shadow of a doubt what is right in the sight of God in any congregation. Why? Because he's given us this beautiful paradigm these paradigms, rather. He's given us this his inspired word. He's preserved it, and so we can know. And so that's what we're doing tonight. We are examining ourselves individually in light of what the word of God says, but then also we're examining ourselves collectively as the body of Christ that meets here on Duluth Highway. And so we consider Laodicea. Laodicea was founded in 3rd century B.C. by Antiochus II, and named in honor of his wife, Laodicea. And it was a great Asian city. It was a great, as in Asia Minor, as you know, uh, great travel routes ran through the city, assuring it of commercial success. You know, when you've got a big interstate coming through your town, obviously there's, there's a lot of people coming through. And, and, and as you can tell here in, in Laodicea, with all of that traveling going through their town or through that city, it brought in a lot of commercial success, which made the town very wealthy. It made it a very affluent place to live. And so it was a wealthy city. They were so wealthy that when the town was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 60, the residents of Laodicea refused help from the Roman government. They said they were going to pay for it out of their own pockets. They were going to dig into their own pockets and make sure that the, the city was rebuilt. That's how wealth or managed them distinct in that area. But then also they were known for the famous school of medicine and responsible, that school was responsible for an eye salve that was called the Phrygian powder. An eye salve, a Phrygian powder is what they sold it as. And so you have them being very wealthy. You have them having this raven black wool clothes that they're selling, which is highly priced. You have them this eye salve. And this will all come to play or into play as the Lord talks to them through his inspired penman. So take with me your Bible and, and, and go to verses 14 and 17 of Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 and 17 and notice what the Lord says to the church of Christ in Laodicea and then we will make some comments on what the Lord has said. He says unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things set the amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of creation of God I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot I word that thou art cold or hot so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot I will spew thee out of my mouth because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor and blind and naked. And so here right off the bat the Lord he gets into a condemnation of this congregation. He does not spend any time talking about the things that they have done right. Apparently there were none. There were nothing that they were doing that was going the right direction. And so the Lord says, first of all, he talks about their determination. And he says, your determination is stagnant. That's what it is. You're not going backwards. You're not going forwards. You're kind of right there in the middle. You're the church on the fence, if you will. You're on that fence and you like it there apparently. The Lord says they were not hot. 
They were not on fire for the Lord. They were not zealous in every good work like their neighbors Philadelphia and Smyrna. They were just a stagnant ditch, if you will, not doing anything backwards or forwards. The Lord expects his children to be fired up for him. The Lord demands it. You see, we get fired up about a lot of things. You've heard me say this before. We get fired up about football. We sit in front of the TV. I like to watch sports. I get fired up when my teams do not do the things that they're supposed to do, or at least trained to do, right? And so we, we understand we get fired up about those things. We may get fired up for the things that we are passionate about, but are we fired up for the Lord? Are we fired up and have the zeal that the Lord requires us to have? To have that type of attitude that says, I am on fire for the Lord. It's in my bones. It's in my body. It's, it's something that I cannot deny like Jeremiah said. I said I wasn't going to preach anymore, but I couldn't stop myself. Why? Because his word was in my heart. It was shut up in my bones like a burning fire. And so the Lord says, these folks were not like that. They were, they were not hot. But then he also says they were not cold. They were not on fire, but they weren't lost either completely. That is, they were not engaging in flagrant sin. Now, when we say they were not lost completely, it means they, they're kind of teetering here. They're on their way out. They're on their way out, and the Lord says, you need to repent of these things. You're going to be wholly lost. And so the Lord says they're not engaging in flagrant sin. They've not tossed him aside. They're still professing some mediocre form of Christianity. And who are these members, if we're going to name them, if we're going to identify them, who are these members that would be like that? Neither hot nor cold. Well, it's that member that darkens the door every now and then. You know them. Every Christmas, maybe Easter, as they celebrate the world, the holidays, they come every now and then just to show us that they're still alive. Just to show us, oh yes, and when you come in, and they come in and you introduce yourself, and they say things like this, oh, but I'm a member here. I can't remember how many times that has happened to me, especially at another congregation I was at. I was there a year, a year, and somebody came in and said that they were a member. I said, no, you're not. Can't be. Couldn't possibly be a member here because I've been here a year and I have never seen you before. How is it? Were you sick? Were you in hospital? Nobody told me I would have come and visited you. No, it's just the case that they have never been to services. They've just made their yearly pilgrimage to the body of Christ there that met there and to show their face and to let everybody know, hey, I'm still alive and they won't be back for another couple of months. Or maybe when they need something, it's that member. It's the member who secures the pew. It's the one who comes and sits and goes. The one who keeps the pew from floating away because if it's not sit there, then something may happen for to float away it's the member who is that pew potato if you will they're not engaged in the work they're not engaged in the things that the congregation is doing all they want to do is come and worship and go home that's all they want to do well that's not christianity it's that member that we're talking about it is those or it are those it is those retired christians you know the christian that says listen i've put in my i've put in my time I've preached all this time, I've taught all this time, and I'm so and so old right now, and I'm not going to do anything anymore. Since when do we retire as Christians? Find me the verse in the Bible where the Lord says when you get to a certain age that you can sit on your hands and just watch the work going on around you. Now, we understand those who are not able to do the work because of age, because of physical ailments. We get that. There's always something we can do, though. We can pray. We can encourage. We can talk to people. We can visit people and things of that nature. But we're talking about these type of individuals. Comparatively speaking, they were not engaged in flagrant sin, but they were also not engaged in the work of the Lord either. And so the Lord says, you're not hot and on fire. You're just that pew potato. You're just sitting there coming to services, a mainstream Christian, if you will. You'll hear me talk about that in the upcoming weeks. That Christian that really thinks they're on their way to heaven, but really they're not. They're on their way to hell from the pew. That's the Lord's stance on the matter because he's going to ask them to repent of this. He says, you are lukewarm. The word lukewarm there, the Lord says they're like water. Have you ever had lukewarm water? You know, it, it's not something that you drink that you go, ooh, that's very refreshing. Maybe if you were in a desert for seven days and you need water, you would think, oh, this is great, right? But generally speaking, we don't drink lukewarm water. The Lord says you are like lukewarm water. You're indifferent. You're listless. You have the I do not care disposition. And this is in full swing at Laodicea. 
The Lord is not just speaking. The Lord is speaking here to the congregation. And he says, this is in full swing among you. This is in full swing. When I look at you as a congregation, they would not preach false doctrine or endorse sin. But they certainly wouldn't speak out against it. They certainly wouldn't do anything about it if it were to take place. One commentator said the following about the church of Christ in Laodicea. It says the Laodicean church might well have been one of the most popular religious movements in the city. But they rocked no boats. They created no ripples. They were a sorry mess of jellyfish do nothings. So what he's saying is, listen, they're just there. That's all there. There's a name on the building that says Church of Christ, if you will. Probably not at that time. There were people who were congregating there every Sunday. You'll see them there Sunday and Wednesday. But that's as far as it went. That's all they did. They were no more than those in the denominational world. If you took all the good that was said about the congregations on one hand and all the bad that was said about the congregations on the other hand, Laodicea would be right there in the middle. Not caring for either. The Lord says you're not hot. You're not cold. You're lukewarm. And what it makes me want to do is vomit you out of my mouth. The word there spew carries the idea of it's making him sick. It's making him physically sick. The Lord uses this comparative language here. He, he refers to himself as having a human body if you will. We understand the Lord is spirit. He's not human. He's not like you and I made of flesh and bone. But he uses this analogy of him drinking this lukewarm water and becoming sick because he is drinking it. It makes him want to spew it out of his mouth. Now you have to appreciate the author of this statement. You have to appreciate who is saying what he is saying. This is the Lord God of heaven. This is Jesus the Christ, God who was at that time uh, ascended up into, to the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father, but he was God in the flesh. This is he who is speaking, and he is telling them, listen, I want you to make a choice. I want you to make a choice, and I want you to decide where you're going to stand, because you can't sit on the fence, because the fence is on Satan's property. The same was posed in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. Where the Lord says, listen, you have been sitting on the fence for long enough. If Baal be God, then you go after him. If, 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 uh, if God is God, then you go after him. But you need to make a choice. But you can't halt between two opinions. You have to do something. Joshua said the same thing in Joshua 24 and verse 15. You need to choose. You need to choose this day whom you're going to serve. But you can't go between two opinions. You have to do something. You have to make a choice. And so the Lord says, I want you to make a choice because I don't like the fact that you are cold or hot. He says, I would rather that you were cold. Now appreciate this. Appreciate it. This is the same Christ who went to the cross to die for these individuals. This is the same cross who gave his body to be beaten. This is the same cross who we talked about this morning. He says, I lay down my life. He died for this entire world. That's what he did. And it is he who was saying, I would rather you be completely away from me or completely for me. It's not the case that Christ wants them to be lost. Do not misunderstand what he's saying. It's not the case that he, he wants them to be lost in their sins and be completely cold, ice cold. That's not what he wants. But what he cannot stand is their inconsistency. What he hates more, according to the text here, is the fact that they're teetering between the two. The Lord says, make up your mind. Either go join the ranks of Satan or stay with me. But you can't sit on the fence. He says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The language symbolically signifies to reject with extreme disgust. Have you ever had food poisoning before? What happens when you have food poisoning? Your body rejects whatever is in there with extreme disgust. That's what your body does. Why? Because there's poison in it and the body is designed to expel those type of things. It's like when you drink alcohol. You know what happens with people when they consume alcohol? The next morning they feel a little bit sick. Why is that? Have you ever wondered about that? Well, it's because it's a poison that you're consuming. Alcohol is a poison. It's by all means a toxin. And the body cannot stand that poison. And so what it does, it gets rid of it 
by any means necessary. They throw up, they sweat very profusely. Why? The, the, it's coming out of their pores. You can smell it when you're around them. Why? Because the body's rejecting it. This is the idea here. It's God is seeing them and he's rejecting them with extreme disgust. What they're doing, just this first part here, they're teetering between two opinions. They're halting between two opinions. The Lord says, Christian, you need to fire it up or shut it off, one of the two. But you can't have it both ways. The Lord says, in your determination, you are stagnant. But then also the Lord says, in your estimation, you are sanctimonious. He says, I have need of nothing. That's what you say. I have need of nothing. Imagine this, if you will. Listen to the church of Christ at Laodicea. We are just so right. We're just so right. Look at all the stuff we have. We don't need anyone or anything. We're self-sufficient. We're probably the greatest church in Asia Minor. We're probably the greatest congregation in Asia Minor. Look at everything that we have. We're just so good. Reminds me of that publican and that uh, Pharisee that were praying. And he was saying, Lord, aren't you just so glad you have me? This is everything that I do. I fast twice a week, give tithes of all that I possess. I'm just the greatest Jew there ever was. They say, I have need of nothing. This is the mindset to which the Lord refers when he rebukes them. In their minds, they were self-sufficient, so much so that they shut Jesus out. The Lord says at the end, I'm knocking at the door. I want to come in. After all, it is my church. No, they've shut Jesus out completely because they're self-sufficient. The minute anyone starts thinking, let alone a congregation, that he or she can do without Jesus, that he or she is the purveyor of every good and perfect gift in his or her life, is the minute that he or she takes the road down to destruction. When you think that you are doing this all by yourself without the aid of God, you're heading down destruction. You're going to see destruction because the goodness of God ought to lead you to think, you know what, I'm receiving all of these things because somewhere someone is blessing me more than I deserve. But this was not the church at Laodicea. What the church at Laodicea were doing was being self-righteous. Self-righteousness says, I am good, I am great based upon my own estimation and not based upon the word of God. Self-righteousness has its roots in pride, thinking oneself highly, thinking oneself very wonderful, more so than others. Self-righteousness is also about self-justification. It's justifying self, looking at self, and then justifying what everyone is doing and saying, well, it is what it is supposed to be, regardless of the word of God. That's what we have in the church of Christ in Laodicea. The Laodicea saints are saying, we are probably the greatest congregation in the province. That's what they're saying. I have actually met folks who have said that. I've met folks on more than one occasion who said that about the congregation they were at. And unfortunately for them, I knew the congregations they were at, and they were wholly mistaken. One said, listen, we're probably the best congregation in this area. And I didn't, I didn't say anything. I was afraid I was going to say something that was, that was probably unkind. But this gentleman, young, ignorant young man, he was saying that, well, they were probably the best congregation. And I said, you don't know that you're poor and blind and naked. You don't understand. One person said that they were the Jerusalem church. That's what they were. They were the Jerusalem church. They were the model church for other congregations to look at and copy. And I knew that congregation. I knew their members. I knew what they stood for. They were not the Jerusalem church. They were not a church that should be a model to anyone. But that's the mindset. Is we're just so great. You know, others should be looking at us. We're not like those other congregation over there. You know, that small congregation. We're not like them. We've got a whole lot more than they do. You know, we're not like those liberals over there. Do You know, we're so much better than they are. That's the mindset that Laodicea seems to have. The Lord says, you are sanctimonious in your estimation. Your determination is stagnant. But then also, he says, your condition, it's suffering. He says, you are wretched. The word wretched carries the idea of someone who is undergoing suffering or trials. The Lord looks at these brethren and he says, you're suffering. You're suffering. You're wretched. Not physically, but spiritually. Imagine if someone were to come over to you and says, you're suffering. Well, your first question to them would be about what? No, I'm not. <laughs> What's going on? You know, if someone were to say, well, you're so wretched, just look at you. 
you know, for physical nature speaking, you would first question why it is that you're saying this because I certainly, I, I don't feel like I'm suffering. I don't feel like anything is wretched in my life as far as the physical nature is concerned. But you see, the reason they can't see the suffering is because they were blind, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. The Lord says, you think you are spiritually stable, you think you are spiritually strong, you think you are spiritually supreme, but you are suffering and you don't even know it. That's the worst part. They were so blind, they didn't even know they were suffering. Your spiritual life is in tatters, your spiritual compass is broken. You are busy killing your soul. That's what you're doing, Laodicea. It's like someone who is addicted to, to drugs. You know, someone who constantly takes the drugs and takes the drugs and takes that. They don't understand what they're doing to their body. They understand, well, this thing may kill you. I had, uh, I won't say the pleasure. There's a young man who my counsel who was on methamphetamine. Uh, and, he, you know, this was after he got off, off of the meth. And, and we talked about <clears throat> him and, 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 and that type of lifestyle. And he says he remembers talking about a girl you know, they, 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 uh, she, she saw her friend dying, and she said, it wouldn't happen to me, and she took it as well. That type of mindset. So blind, it's not going to happen to me. The Church of Christ here in Laodicea, they thought their spiritual life was where it needed to be, but it was not. They were suffering spiritually. It is not the case that you cannot know whether you're right spiritually or not. That's, not. that's not the problem here. You can certainly know. God has told us that we can know. The problem is that they were going about to establish their own righteousness. Have not Sorry. That's what it is. The word here, miserable, the Lord uses, is the idea of being worthy of pity. Have you ever looked at someone and you realize they're heading down a, a road of destruction and what do you do? You just wag your head. What are you going to do, right? You pity them because they're foolish and they're heading down a road to destruction and you, you know, you've talked to them, you may have said something to them and all you could do is shake your head and go, they're going to run into destruction. And that is exactly how the Lord looks at, at this congregation. He looks at them with great pity and he says, listen, you're miserable. You're worthy of pity because you're so blind. He looked at this congregation. He shook his head. The children of mine, they don't know what they're doing. They are so blind. They do not understand their current predicament. They do not understand the pain that awaits them. Romans chapter 1 or 9 verses 1 through 3, the apostle Paul had the same mindset about the saints there in Jerusalem. He says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am, uh, uh, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. For I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish myself a curse for Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. You know what, he, he had this great sorrow because he sees what they're doing and he realizes they are going to be lost. And he has great pity on them. That's how the Lord is seeing the, this congregation. He says, you are a sorry bunch, worthy of pity, he says. But not only that, number five, he says, your reputation is strapped. Strapped. You're broke. That's what you are. The congregation had physical wealth. Remember, this was a wealthy city, and they had physical wealth. Their coffers were full. Their members were rich. They had need of nothing. They were well off physical. But the Lord says, you are spiritually broke. That's what you are. You don't understand that you're poor. You don't understand that you have absolutely nothing. You know, Marshall Keeble, I was told, was taken by uh, another individual when he was in town and the individual had amassed a lot of things and amassed a lot of wealth, you know, and the visual was very materialistic apparently in nature. And so what he did is he, he took Brother Keeble around, I'm told, all the way and, and, and he showed him, look at, look at all this thing that I've built over here. He took him over to his farm. He said, look at, look at all the herd of cattle that I have. He took him to his house and he showed, look at all the, the great house that I have. And he said, what do you think, Brother Keeble? What do you think? And Brother Keeble says, well, I think it's all going to burn. <laughs> I said, absolutely. What good will all of your stuff do when you stand before the God of heaven, spiritually in debt up to your ears? You see, that's what the Lord is looking at them and says, you don't understand. You have all of these physical things, but you have no spiritual wealth. Jesus died so that we can be free from the debt of sin. He ransomed us free. These folks were putting themselves back into Satan's debt. That's what they were doing. 
They were putting them back into their debt. They were going to have to pay the wages of sin. Romans 6 and verse 23. The Lord says you are broke. Their determination is stagnant. Their estimation is sanctimonious. Their condition is suffering. Their disposition is sorry. Your reputation is strapped. Your vision, he says, shrouded. Remember the city was known for its eyes salve. You may have good physical eyesight because you have the salve in your midst. You may have this good physical 2020, but as spiritually concerned, the Lord says, you're blind. You're blind. You know, Christians ought to have a way of, different see, of seeing things differently. We see spiritual before we see physical. We're always thinking spiritual before we think anything physical. What are the spiritual, uh, 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 what are spiritual implications here? Everything we do, everything we say, everything we think is with the lens called the Bible. We look through it and we ask ourselves the question, is this glorifying God in what I'm doing? Is this going to hinder or help me doing the will and work of the Lord? Is this going to hinder or help the will of Christ in this area, in what we're trying to do for Him? How will this affect me spiritually? Some folks don't ask the question. I'm reminded of a, of a conversation I've had so many times with individuals. They move somewhere. And the first thing I ask them is, where are you going to worship? You're planning to move somewhere. Where are you going to worship? We haven't thought about that. What do you mean you haven't thought about that? That's the first thing you ought to think about. Where, how am I going to serve the Lord where I am? Now certainly if you say, listen, we thought about it. There's no church in the area. We're going to set up uh, the Lord's church in that area. We're going to worship in the house. We're going to do the world and work of the Lord. That's great. You ought to think about that. But so many, they don't even think about it because they're not thinking spiritually. This congregation, they were not thinking spiritually. They were thinking physically. They were only concerned about that which is physical. And the Lord says, you are blind. You cannot see. And so he says, your protection, you're stark naked. You don't even have any clothes. You know, even a homeless person has a coat. The Lord says, you don't even have a coat. Spiritually speaking, you are completely without protection. You are completely without protection from the elements. They were naked. They were unclothed. Their shame was laid bare. Their protection was non-existent. They were not clothed or dressed in righteousness, holiness, or godliness. There was no cloak of salvation on them. The Lord says, you are naked. That's what you are. It's not something that we, we when we think about it, spiritually speaking... You know, the Lord says you have absolutely no protection whatsoever. Laodicea is walking around with their fine clothes and their robes made from raven black wool. That's what they have in the city. And they're thinking to themselves, we're well dressed. Oh, look at this. Look at the clothes we have. The Lord says you don't even know. You're completely naked. Imagine, if you will, the Lord God of heaven. He's looking down at his children and he's saying all of these things about them. Imagine being there in that congregation that morning and hearing that letter. The Lord looking at them and he says to the Laodiceans, he says, this is what I think about you. You are a stagnant ditch. Lukewarm. You're not going forward or backwards. You're sanctimonious. You're suffering sorrowful, poor, blind, naked condition. It makes me sick. Makes me sick. You know, somebody had said once, you know, certain things only the Lord can say. And I think that's one of the things. He looks at his, his, his children, and I think only the Lord can say, you know what, you make me sick. I hope that's not how we make the Lord feel. Never. I hope the Lord doesn't look at us and, and then look at us and says, listen, look at what you have and look at everything. Look at what you're doing. I hope we never get to a point where we, where we are in, in, in the mind of our Lord. He looks upon us with that type of disdain. I hope it never happens. But we have to make sure that it does not. Notice the condition or the commission 
last that he gives them here, the commission that the Lord gives. He says, I counsel thee, buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thou, thy shame of, and thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see, as I, many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The, the phrase here that proceeds or that follows everything that he just asked them to do is summed up, or everything that he just asked them to do is summed up in the phrase, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. This is what you need to do. You need to purchase stock in heaven. You need to purchase stock in heaven. Why not come and receive the unsearchable riches of Christ? You need to make sure that you're focusing on things that are above and not on the things of this earth. Wealthy city, it's easy to get lost in there. It's easy to get lost in this world and everything that we have. We're certainly blessed abundantly and I hope we're using it to God's glory. But don't get lost in it. You need to make sure that your purchased stock in heaven, the Lord says, you need to procure robes from Him. He says, you need to get a garment from Him, this raven black wool. Listen, it's not going to do anything for you come judgment. He says, you need to get robes from me, white. You need to get robes that is going to clothe you in salvation. Jesus wants them to once again wear robes that are not stained with sin, but that are white as snow. What Jesus is offering to them is forgiveness for their gross misconduct. Everything that I just read about what they were and what the Lord said they were was forgivable. The Lord once again extends his hand of forgiveness and he says, Listen, I can and I will forgive you if you will repent. If you procure robes from, from the Father, if you procure robes from me, put salve on your eyes. The, the great physician, Jesus the Christ, he says, I have an ointment that will open your eyes. I have an ointment that will help you see the way you need to see. The ointment will make you see what's really going on in your lives. If you want to know what's really going on in your life, if you are doing some introspection, read the Bible. Read the Bible and compare your life to it. You'll know what's going on in your life. If you want to know where you are in the sight of God, if you want to open your eyes, read the scriptures. It will tell you exactly where you are. When you take what you do, who you are, and you put it right next to the scriptures, you will know exactly what God thinks of you. You will know exactly whether you are right with him or whether you are way in the wrong. All you have to do is pick up the word of God. He has an ointment to open our eyes. The word of God, Proverbs chapter 6 and 23, for the commandment of the Lord is a lamp and, a, and his law is a light. It reproves of instruction. It gives reproof and instruction. And it, uh, it is the way of life. And so we understand that in his word, I can find the things I need to be what he wants me to be. Laodicea, I am at your door. If you need it, I have it. If it's broken, I'll fix it. I'm here to offer you help to get out of the pit in which you are. And he says to them in verses 20 and 21, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I'm sat down with my father. I'm knocking. I want in. I want to be in your lives. I want to be in this congregation, the Lord says. But you need to let me in. Did you notice that they didn't go look for Jesus? You know, people sometimes say they found God as if he's the one that were lost. He's, he was lost. He doesn't need to be found. We were lost. And who came looking for us? God came looking for us. In the garden, it was him who approached the first couple. When the world was lost in sin, it was he who saved Noah and his family, who approached Noah. When the world needed a savior, it was he who sent his son. He sent the prophets, he sent the apostles, and he sent Christians today. God is always the one knocking. He is always the one making that, he's taking the first step. And he is telling them, I am at the door. I'm knocking. I'm inviting. 
He says, I want you to come and eat with me. The idea of eating together is fellowship. It's the most basic form of fellowship. It's the idea that I want us to be able to sit and meet with one another. I want us to be in communion once again. That's what the Lord is offering them. The Lord says, I come knocking, inviting to fellowship. I come rewarding. The Lord says, there is, there's a reward waiting for you. You know, we do not serve the Lord God and follow his commandments for the sake of serving the Lord God and following his commandments. Aren't you glad that we do not follow a system where there is no reward at the end? Imagine, if you will, living the way you're living right now, refusing the pleasures of this world, the sinful things of this world, only to die and there be nothing. As Paul said, we of all men will be most miserable if there is no resurrection. The Lord is not calling us to that type of life. He says, listen, I have a reward. I want you to live right. I want you to do right because there is something that you can receive. You will not be subject to the second death. You will be raised to spend eternity with the Father. Laodicea, I am giving you an opportunity to get right. You need to take it. If this congregation in Laodicea does not get right, Persecution is coming their way very, very heavily. They're going to suffer in that persecution. Because if they retain the mindset that they had, they're going to give up the Lord immediately when persecution arises. They're not going to stand for righteousness. They're not going to stand for that which is right because they're more concerned about the world than they are about the things of the Lord. The Lord looks at this church on the fence And he says you need to get off because the fence is on Satan's property. May we never be on the fence as a Christian. May we always stand where God stands. May we boldly proclaim that we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. As individuals, as a congregation, may we always take a stand for righteousness and not step back and say, well, we're not going to say anything lest we be indicted. We're not going to do anything lest we think. No, let's always be a congregation of the Lord's people that does not lose our focus, that doesn't sit on the fence. Let's always be a congregation of the Lord's people that makes It's a beautiful paradigm. It's a beautiful account. And by all means, I have not drawn out a whole lot that was there, merely telling you what the Scripture says. There's much more that certainly can be found in there if you would... If you would study it and encourage it. But this afternoon, if you've heard something that has pricked your heart, if you've looked at the, the, the way God has described them and you realize, well, that's who I am. I'm doing the same things that my brethren did in the first century. You may be stagnant in your ways. You may be indecisive of whether you want to be righteous or not. You may not be committed to the Lord the way you are. Maybe it's self-righteousness and sanctimonious, acting in a sanctimonious way. Whatever it is, if it, if it falls in line with what God has used to condemn them, by all means, we have this paradigm in front of us to learn from it. And we too can be forgiven just like Jesus extended to them. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, the Lord is still knocking. That's what he does. The world is still standing. That means the Lord is still knocking. He wants you to be saved. There's no doubt about it. He has delayed the coming of his son so that those who have not yet repented may have an opportunity to repent of their sins and to put on Jesus in baptism. Do you have need of heaven's invitation this evening? Do you need to obey the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? You need to get off the fence and into Christ. Stop teetering or stop halting behind two opinions. If the Lord's plan of salvation is indeed in the scriptures, won't you obey it tonight? If you can find these things in the Bible and find it to be so, then by all means do so. Hear the glorious gospel of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Believe it. Repent of sins. Confess his good name before witnesses and be immersed in water for the remission of sins. You have to make that choice at some point before it's eternally too late while we stand and as we sing.